And I said, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad. And I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. I'll miss you. And maybe I'll understand why you had to do it to get out of the pain. And I thought to myself, did I just say that or did I think it? Because if I said it, I just gave her permission to go out and kill herself. Mm -hmm. And I realized I'd said it and I thought, oh, what a mistake. And then she looked at me and she grabbed onto my eyes like I'm grabbing onto your eyes. And I thought she was going to say, thank you for understanding. I'm overdue. And I said, I said, Nancy, what are you thinking? And then she looked at me and she said, if you can really understand why I might uh, have to kill myself to get out of the pain, maybe I won't need to. Today on the show, I am joined by Dr. Mark Goldston, a psychiatrist, former UCLA professor of psychiatry, former professor, FBI and police hostage negotiator, best-selling author of nine books, including Just Listen. That book has been translated into 28 languages. Dr. Goldston is also the host of the highly rated podcast, My Wake Up Call. Uh, so Dr. Goldston, thank you so much for, for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me on, Joe. I've really been looking forward to this. Uh, absolutely, me too. So um, I would just kind of love to start this off by talking, I guess, about your backstory, because I find this fascinating. So you're a medical doctor that specialized as a psychiatrist, uh, but for over 20 years, you were a suicide prevention specialist. I wonder if you could talk to me about what mm -hmm. led you onto that path and why you were so effective at it. Most of us who are passionate about something have a backstory. We have a personal story. And I have a backstory. Uh, and my backstory is that uh, I dropped out of medical school twice uh, and finished. And I don't really know anybody who has done that. And I didn't drop out to see the world. I dropped out because in retrospect, I think I had untreated depression. So the first time I dropped out, dropped out and I worked in blue collar jobs, which I loved, gave my mind a break. And medical school, you know, they'll allow you to take a leave of absence because they know it can be stressful. And uh, there's a fair amount of people who, when they're in the middle of training, they say, I, I need a break from this. So I took the break, came back. And in six months, I think the depression was back. So I asked for another, what's called a leave of absence. Uh, and I was passing everything. And I met with the head of the school who cares about fundraising and money. He was the dean of the school. And what I didn't know is that every time someone took time off, like I was asking for, for a second time, the medical school lost money because they lost matching funds. So I don't even remember the meeting with him. I was at a pretty low point. And I get a call from the dean of students who cares about students and the main dean had called him and said, uh, uh, we're sending you a letter to go speak to this Goulston student because we uh, were asking him um, to leave because we just don't think he's going to make it as a doctor. And I think the head of the school didn't want to tell me that directly and have me do something self-destructive. Uh, so the dean of students calls me and says, I've got a letter here from the dean. You better come in here, Mark. And I'm at a low point, Joe. And, uh, and he says, here, read the letter. And I read the letter. It says, um, we've met with Mr. Goulston. I've met with Mr. Goulston. We talked about another career. And I'm advising the promotions committee that he be asked to withdraw, which is a nice way of saying we want to kick him out. And miraculously, I was passing everything, and I was so low, Joe, I said, what does this mean? And the dean of students looked at me, and he said, you've been kicked out. And I'm not really religious or spiritual. Some people say I'm spiritual, but it felt like someone had just kicked me in the stomach. Mm -hmm. And I kind of folded over, and my 
felt I felt something wet on my cheekbones and I thought it was blood. So I just kept touching my hands and looking at them. And it wasn't blood, it was tears. And uh, and and imagine this when you feel pretty low and you feel that your whole value is what you do in the world and you can't do anything. Imagine hearing this, because I think what he did for me is something I call the trifecta of hope, which is what I use with all my suicidal patients. He said, he said, Mark, you didn't mess up, but because you're passing everything, but you are messed up. But if you got unmessed up, I think this school would be glad they gave you another chance. So I then just start kind of crying from his compassion. What? What are you saying? And then he said, and even if you don't get unmessed up, even if you don't become a doctor, even if you don't do anything the rest of your life, I'd be proud to know you. And then I'm just, what is he saying? Uh, and he said, because you have you have a streak inside you of goodness um, that the world needs more than you know, and you won't know how much the world needs it until you're 35, but you need to make it till you're 35. And I can't look at him at this point. I'm just I'm just crying. And he says, "Look at me." And he points his finger at me. He says, "Look at me." He says, "You deserve to be on this planet, and you're going to let me help you." So the trifecta of hope is he saw value in me where I didn't have to do anything other than be, I guess, a good person. You know, everywhere else, you know, who cares if you're a good person? What are you doing? Right. And I came from a background like that. You're only worth something if you can do something. So he saw goodness in me. He saw value in me just for being me. Couldn't fail at that. He saw a future for me, which I didn't see. And the third thing is he went to bat for me against the medical school. So he, he was just a PhD and he stood up for me against all these medical doctors in the promotions committee. And he basically said, we're gonna give this kid another chance. And then I had to present myself, why should they give me another chance? And that went pretty well, obviously. <clears throat> and so I took a year off and then I went and did some work at something called the Menninger Foundation, which is still around. Uh, it was in Topeka, Kansas in the States then. Uh, now it's based in Houston, but it was one of the leading psychiatric uh, foundations or institutions in America for many years after World War II. And I grew up just outside of Boston. I don't know anything about farm boys and farm girls. And, uh, and this was outside of Topeka, Kansas. And uh, I sort of had a knack. I sort of had a way of reaching farm boys or farm girls. You know, and, and I tucked that away thinking, geez, I didn't think I had a knack for anything. But knowing that was there, I then went back, finished medical school, went on to UCLA to uh, be trained in psychiatry. And uh, then I became a psychiatrist focused on uh, many things, but one of the focuses was on suicide prevention. And I'll tell you something that I learned, uh, and you, you were going to ask me about it. And, it, it. and there's a process that I call surgical empathy, but I've only given it a name in the last couple of years. What I realize, and if you're listening to this and you've been suicidal or you're worried about someone who's suicidal, when someone is feeling suicidal and they, and they just feel locked in, you have to go where they're at. They can't come to you. There's something inside there where they're blocked. And they're not only blocked, they're they're attached to death as a way to take away their pain. So, uh, and in fact, anyone uh, who has been suicidal more than once felt that way, they still tuck it in the back of their back pocket. They don't talk to people about it because they don't want to scare you. 
but in their back pocket, they're thinking if worse comes to worse, I can always go away and never come back. And, uh, and so surgical empathy is a way of going in and breaking their attachment to death as a way to relieving their pain and replacing it with empathy. And I'll give you an example of the difference between surgical empathy and clinical professional empathy. So I'd like you to imagine that you're really depressed and you're really locked in. And so imagine that and you're seeing someone, a friend, because friends can learn this, a therapist, psychiatrist, psychologist. So professional empathy, uh, because you're checking boxes, might say, have you felt depressed? Yes. Um, yeah. And how long have you felt depressed? Uh, a year. Uh, have you thought of hurting yourself when it gets bad? Yes. Do you have a way to do that? Well, we do have a gun in the house. So, uh, so that's all professional. That's clinical. Mm. And, th and that's good because you have to check boxes. But imagine you're in that state of mind. And instead of saying that, that way, I were to say, uh, Joe, uh, you've been depressed. Isn't that true? Yeah. You've been really depressed, like scary depressed. Isn't that true? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you've been so depressed, you didn't know how you were going to make it through the day. Had some of those? Uh-huh. And, and there have been times when you felt so depressed you couldn't take it anymore. Is that true? But can you, can you feel the difference? One is being here with me. One is distant. One is pro professional. Mm. Um, and the other one is... When you said that the the latter to me, I felt as if you were uh, feeling by the the hypothetical pain with me, like you were there. It was kind of, it wasn't you, me, and an obstacle. It was you and me with the obstacle bias. If that makes sense, it felt a lot closer. In it, it felt a relief when I was imagining myself in that situation. And so you felt less alone with it, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. And and because you felt less alone, plus I wasn't judging you. See, if I say, have you been depressed? Even though I'm not judging you in the question, you can think, oh, if he thinks mm. I'm depressed, he's going to think less of me or, or he's going to hospitalize me. Mm. And I, you know. And, and I don't want him to, be, I don't want to be locked up. I, you know, I'm just coming because someone told me I needed to go see someone. Right. So that's kind of the difference. And, uh, and I really appreciate your, your listeners and viewers uh, may not know this, but uh, I feel privileged uh, to be part of a documentary that I co-created and moderated. It's up at Amazon Prime now. It just recently went up. And it's called Stay Alive, an Intimate Conversation About Suicide Prevention. And in it, I speak with a fellow named Kevin Hines. And Kevin jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge and survived. Uh, and he speaks all over the world. In fact, Kevin, uh, and we're going to share this because I said, Kevin, uh, he has a white paper, meaning a research paper, that is evident, is evident, evidence-based proof that his going around the world sharing his story has saved lives. So we, we have a white paper that shows evidence that so many people have written him, come up to him and say, you know, you saved my life that day. And, that, and that's because people could feel that he felt what they felt like. So we're, very, ex we're very excited about it. Um, and it also involves uh, a Japanese pop singer named Reiko, and she's a suicide prevention advocate because uh, Asian countries, especially Korea, 
in Japan, they have incredibly high suicide rates because the pressure on their youth to be successful is huge. And uh, so, so we're hoping we'll get the word out and, and that's why I was really excited to be invited to be on your show so that maybe we can get people to check that out and maybe we can all save some lives together. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let's definitely, let's talk about that documentary because uh, I watched uh, the documentary um, in preparing for this. I watched the documentary Staying Alive. Um, I'm going to put a link below to that. And also another documentary that I know that you've been heavily involved with was the Tell My Story documentary, which I found incredibly moving. In fact, I, I have to admit, I, I couldn't watch it all in one sitting because it was very, very emotional. Um, but one part of the documentary, um, the Staying Alive documentary that I would love to pick up on that really, really hit home for me was that you say that people can become attached to death as a way to relieve the pain and that people may not necessarily want to die. They just want a relief from that pain. Um, I found this incredibly profound. So I wonder if you could kind of talk about this and elaborate on that. Yes, yeah, so after Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade, who are pretty well known in America, mm -hmm. they died by suicide the same week. And I wrote a blog uh, I think it's either up at the Huffington Post or Medium, and it said, why people kill themselves, it's not depression. It got about 400,000 views in a week and a half because of, that's a pretty provocative title, why people kill themselves, it's not depression. And what I wrote about is that there's hundreds of millions of people, maybe I wouldn't say billions, but maybe over a billion of people who are depressed. And the majority of them don't, don't kill themselves. There's hundreds of millions of people who lose a job, who lose a marriage, or lose a child, and they don't kill themselves. Now, all of those can contribute to wanting to kill yourself or get relief. But in my work as focused on suicide prevention, one of the things I found that nearly all of them have in common is they feel despair. And if you break the word despair into D-E-S dash P-A-I-R, des pair means feeling unpaired. So unpaired with a future is hopeless. Unpaired with the ability to help yourself is helpless, powerless worthless, useless, meaningless, uh, purposeless. And at the end, when all of them line up, what you feel is it's pointless to go on. So what happens is people at the end feel unpaired with reasons to live. And, and one of the things we talk about is that people form psychological adhesions. In the video, uh, in, in the documentary, I think we called it attachments, but it's much deeper. An adhesion is like what happens between your organs after surgery. You know, after surgery, sometimes, which saves your life, sometimes the organs stick together, called an adhesion, and you have to go in and break the adhesion. So, People who feel all those lesses, helpless, hopeless, worthless, meaningless, et cetera, they can often form a psychological adhesion to death. And death is basically saying, I'll take your pain away. And so surgical empathy is a way of going in. And when they feel felt by you, which is different than evaluated by you, they may let go of death and grab onto you. There was a young woman that I'll call Nancy, and she had made two or three suicide attempts prior to my seeing her. She'd been in the hospital two to three months every year for several years. And way back then, you could be in the hospital for two or three months. 
And one of my mentors was a fellow named Dr. Ed Schneidman, and he was one of the world's leading authorities and experts on suicide prevention. So he was at UCLA when I was there, and he'd refer me these highly suicidal people who were in the inpatient unit. And in order to be released, someone in the community, another doctor, needed to say, I'll see them. So what would happen is uh, Dr. Schneidman would call me and it would always be the same call. Mark, this is Ed. I'm with this lovely young woman. She's in a lot of pain. You could help her, Mark. See her. And then he'd put her on the phone. And so Nancy was one of those people. And I'd seen her for six months or so, a couple times a week, and I didn't think I was helping her. She rarely made eye contact when she came in. And she wasn't catatonic, but she was not connecting to me. And in those days, I used to work once a month uh, uh, at a state hospital covering for other psychiatrists. It's called moonlighting. I would cover for them. And sometimes you're up 36 hours and you're sleep deprived. And I came in on a Monday after uh, I was sleep deprived and there was Nancy not looking at me. And as I sat with her, uh, all the color in the room turned to black and white. So I'm looking at the room and it's black and white. And I thought, whoa, what is this about? And then I got the chills. And I thought, I'm having a stroke or a seizure. And she wasn't looking at me, so it wasn't rude. And I proceeded to do a neurologic examination, which means I tapped my elbows, I looked at my fingers, I tapped my knees to see if I was having a stroke or a seizure. And I thought to myself, no, nope, I'm all here. And then I had this crazy idea, Joe, that I was looking at the world through her eyes and just feeling what it felt like. Wow. So I leaned into it. And because I was sleep deprived, I blurted something out that normally I wouldn't say. And I said, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad. And I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. I'll miss you. And maybe I'll understand why you had to do it to get out of the pain. And I thought to myself, did I just say that or did I think it? Because if I said it, I just gave her permission to go out and kill herself. Mm -hmm. And I realized I'd said it and I thought, oh, what a mistake. And then she looked at me and she grabbed onto my eyes like I'm grabbing onto your eyes. And I thought she was going to say, thank you for understanding. I'm overdue. And I said, I said, Nancy, what are you thinking? And then she looked at me and she said, if you can really understand why I might uh, have to kill myself to get out of the pain, maybe I won't need to. Mm. And then she smiled. That was surgical empathy. And then I grabbed under her eyes because this was the first time we made eye contact. And I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm not going to throw treatments at you that we've tried, other people have tried, and haven't worked unless you reach out to me and say, maybe we should try something or other. Would that be okay if I didn't throw treatments at you? And she kept looking at me with a look that said, keep talking, keep talking. I'm intrigued here. And then I leaned into her eyes, like I'm leaning into yours. And I said, what we're going to do instead, Nancy, is I'm going to find you wherever you are and I'm going to keep you company there. Because I just don't want you to be alone anymore. Mm -hmm. Would that be okay? And then her eyes started to water. Just like Michaela's did. And, and, as, she, and as her eyes watered, uh, that was the beginning of turning things around. And it was very similar to what happened, if you remember my story with the dean of students. He reached in, grabbed into my eyes, and saw something in me and went to bat for me, and it turned things around. Right. And, and I'm just thinking back uh, to actually to a conversation that I had with 
uh, the former Harvard professor, uh, Tal Ben Shahar. Uh, and if you don't know him, I would love to, to put you in touch with him because this guy is, I thought he was fantastic. And he created, um, I think, Harvard's most popular ever course on uh, popular psych uh, positive psychology. And I remember that he said to me that depression is sadness without hope. And kind of listening to what you described, what the Dean of Students did for you, what you did for Nancy, um, it, it actually has got me thinking about um, how perhaps viral that emotions can be. And I, I'm just thinking of this out loud, but um, a few days ago, I was in a fantastic mood and I met someone and they were in a downer, a big, big downer. And it didn't take very long for their mood to infect me. What you described that you did for Nancy, what the Dean of Students did for you, is that perhaps that their hope, their compassion, their understanding was a viral, was viral and it kind of it infected, you were infected, Nancy. Am I kind of on the right lines with that? Yeah, you're on the right lines and you're reminding me of something that I want to have your listeners and viewers try. Over the years, when I would see patients who were depressed or anxious or suffering from some other uh, uh, mental issue, there were times when I would push them. And again, here's a, another example of surgical empathy is someone says something and you say, no, I understand you're frustrated with your life, but what's really going on? And they'll say something else. Well, you know, I, I just don't know how to feel better. And uh, I think I'm a burden to other people. Uh, yeah, I understand that, but what's really going on? Mm -hmm. And when you do something I call the five realies, sometimes people open up and something that a number of my depressed patients would say is uh, maybe I don't deserve to feel happy because down deep, all I care about is myself. I am totally self-absorbed. I don't think about anyone or anything else. And maybe one of the reasons I'm unhappy is I'm so self-centered. You know, why should the world make me happy? I don't care about the world. And what I started doing, and here's what you can do as an experiment. And I think Joe would be interested in your doing this. And maybe Joe can try it. Is what I used to do is I used to give my patients a box of that contained healthy snacks inside them healthy little treats, you know, uh, like a mixture of uh, uh, nuts and berries and whatever. And I say, what I'd like you to do is if you're in Los Angeles, you can't go anywhere in Los Angeles with walking without walking by a homeless person. I mean, they're just sadly everywhere. Uh, or if you're driving your car, there's a homeless person who comes up to your windshield. And I said, what I would like you to do uh, you may not have the time if it's at a traffic stop, but I want you to always carry some of these healthy snacks with you. And when you see a homeless person, I want you to take out one of the snacks and hold it in your hand because you don't want to scare them going over to them and putting your hand in your pocket. They'll, they'll get nervous. So I have a healthy snack in your hand. Go over to one of the homeless people. Go over slowly. Don't scare them. And mention your name. Uh, uh, hi, my name's Joe. What's your name? You know, homeless people do have names. They are people. Mm -hmm. And they'll go, what, what? You could say, yeah, my name's Joe. What's your name? Uh, my name's Frank. Uh, hey, Frank. Uh, and then you're, you uh, outreach your hand and you give them the healthy snack and you say, look, I hope this helps a little bit. And, and then you can say something like, I know you think that there's no way out of this. But just because you believe that doesn't mean there isn't. And I want you to hang in there. And then leave. Now, if you want, you can get into a longer conversation. But these are, you know, what I would say to my depressed patients, I want you to do that once a day for a week. Why? Because they felt so self-absorbed. This is something that would be the last thing they would think of doing. They come back the next week and I'd say, so how did it work out? And they would look at me sheepishly and say, 
it helped. <laughs> they didn't want to own up to it. Um, in fact, I remember one of them coming in and uh, and he, I said, how did it work out? And he teared up and I thought, oh, geez, he got depressed. Uh, I said, what's wrong? He said, no, no, no. Uh, I'm not crying because there's anything wrong with me. You know, the homeless person looked into my eyes and when I handed him a healthy snack, he looked at the healthy snack and then he looked in my eyes and he said, bless you. So are you kind of following this? And uh, it's, it's not a bad exercise. Uh, uh, would love to see if we could start a movement and see where that goes. Right, absolutely. We can try to create a pandemic of hope, of understanding, of, of being there. Um, so just in terms of some of the, the great tips that, you know, you've talked about today, you know, we've, we've got the five reallys. We're talking about surgical empathy. These are all things that we can kind of do for other people. But I'd love it if you could talk perhaps directly. Someone's listening to this now. They are feeling lost depressed, feeling suicidal, hopeless, worthless, uh, all those things that you mentioned. Um, I would love to uh, ask you if you could talk directly to someone, what would your advice be as a psychiatrist, as a suicide preventionist? For the person listening to this now that is all those things, what would your advice to them be? Okay, so just as I... Uh did a role play with you. I'm going to do a role play with that person who's listening or seeing this and is feeling hopeless. But you're listening, aren't you? You may be thinking, yeah, that'll work for other people, but nothing will work for me. But you're listening, aren't you? And you may be getting angry. Yeah, I'm listening, but you're making me, you know, get agitated. Uh, and Something that I know, something that maybe we can talk more about this, something I am trying to teach the world. And I spoke in Moscow a few years ago with a Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman. He wrote a book, Thinking Fast and Slow, and, and several of my books have done pretty well in Russia. So I was one of the headline speakers along with him. And one of the things I've been trying to teach the world is that whoever you're with, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's me with Joe or me with a thousand people or me with a homeless person or me with you if you're listening in and you're feeling, everybody is always listening for something underneath their listening to you. So one of the things Joe is listening for is you know, Dr. Goulston or Mark, whatever you want to call me, you've really given some good tips, but there may be people listening in who right now are in a bad place. And can you give them something to hold on to so that they don't do something destructive? And so do you follow me? So you yeah. reached out to me and you're listening for what can Dr. Goulston say that might help them? And so if you are that person and you're listening for something, what I'm hearing you say, and it's screaming out at me and Joe right now, is I can't make the hurt go away. It just won't go away. I've tried everything and the hurt won't go away. And and I don't know if I can take it much longer. And Joe and I are hearing you say that. And we're not going to throw stuff at you. But we're hearing you say it. And I want you to imagine, even though this is asynchronous, <laughs> Um, that we're hearing you. And all I'll say for you is what 
my dean of students said for me, there's a future for you that you can't see. There's a future for you that you can't believe is there. And this is going to sound like BS. There may be a reason for what you're going through other than, you know, the world is punishing you. When I was going through it, and it wasn't just the, something that happened, I dropped out of medical school twice. So yes, you know, there were periods where I recovered, but we're talking about a four-year span <laughs> of feeling depressed at times. And if someone said to me, well, maybe there's a reason that you're going through this, I would have gotten angry at them. But the reason it turned out to be is, you know, Mark, if you go through this and you know you can walk through it and out the other side, you might be able to reach people who are feeling the same. And I wouldn't have believed them in a second. I would have thought they were just kind of a, uh, talk, you know, talking at me, and uh, and that siren's coming to take us all away. But uh, uh, I guess what I would say to you is, uh, uh, and and we're not, and Joe and I are not just dumping this on you. Uh, reach out to someone. Uh, I'll tell you one of the things that I do. I have something I call the Dead Mentors Society. I have eight mentors, they've all died. And they started with the Dean of Students. And the last one was Larry King, the person on CNN. I, I, I went to breakfast with him almost every day for two years before COVID in this little breakfast group. And one of the, and one of the things I do when I'm feeling down, or I felt I really made a, stupid mistake is I'll call up one of the dead mentors in my head and I'll and I'll imagine having a conversation with them and they're all dead and I'll imagine them walking me through it there was a time when I would be on podcasts and uh, I would start a story I'd get lost in the story I would say, you know, there's five things you should remember about this. And I could only remember three of them. <laughs> and sometimes after a podcast, I'd call up Larry King, who died. And I'd say, Larry, Larry, wake up. And he had this thick Brooklyn accent. What, what, Mark, you're waking me? What are you waking me for? I'm not even cold. Larry, Larry, wake up. What, what what's this about, Mark? Uh, I did it again. What did you do, Mark? I started a story I did. I couldn't remember where I was going. Yeah. So, yeah. And then I came up with these five things and I could only remember three of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what the host think, Mark? Oh, well, the host wants me back again. <laughs> Mark, Mark, you know, I'm not even cold. Can you let me go rest in peace already? Come on, man. Put a sock in it. And what happens is when I remember these people, and I imagine them talking me through it. I'm overcome with feeling grateful to them. Boy, was I lucky that you were a mentor. Was I lucky that you gave me the gift of your time? Was I lucky that you believed in me? Dean McNary back at Boston University when I didn't. That you went to bat for me when I couldn't. Um, If you can think of someone, if you're that listener, living or dead, and you might say, I never had someone like that. Well, why pick a hero, pick an athletic hero who you've never met. Pick an athletic hero who actually cares about people. And, and imagine talking your way through it with them and they would say the same thing. They might not have the Brooklyn accent. They might say, what's going on? Uh, I'm just really feeling low. Tell me what's going on. 
and then imagine them talking you through it so that you don't have to feel alone in the dark night of your soul. I thought that was really, really, really beautiful. And a, a lesson that I've learned from this show from my own life is that I've never solved any serious problems in my own head is that I only solve them out loud. We only recover out loud, whether that's, even if it's writing something down on a paper, writing in your notes, speaking to a friend. Um, I think that it's so essential. I really, really, really thank you so much for coming on and, and talking about these um, these vital topics. Um, we got about 20 minutes left, so I'd love to just kind of uh, go through some of your other work that I'm really interested in. Yeah, I want to share something about what please. you just said. Please, please. <laughs> so, I keep a journal. Here's the latest volume. Volume 256. I started keeping a journal when I finished medical school. It took me six years to do four. On the day I graduated from medical school, I took out a journal and I wasn't a writer. I was a, you know, I was a medical student who made it through, through medical school. And the first thing I wrote in it, I put the date, 1976. I said, I can't believe I made it through. They've released the crazy person. And so I'm on volume 256, 45,000 pages, nine books, 1100 articles for a C student in English. And what I do is I just write down anything. You know, I write down what I think, what I feel, and and what I discover, I put down the date, put a little title on it. And if I'm still thinking or feeling about that, maybe two months from now, I'll write an article. Or if it keeps coming back, and here's the crazy thing. This is this is actually really crazy. I mean, I don't think I'm that famous. I don't think I'm that well-known, but some people say I'm pretty well-known. So this is what's crazy. Uh, I, have a, I don't even know what an NFT is. And so I'm speaking to a company and they say, you know, Mark, you could sell those journals one of a kind as NFTs. People would own a piece of you and there's only one of a kind. I'd say, but you can hardly read them. I mean, I write like a doctor. They, they say they don't care. So I'm actually speaking to someone later today. I said, you gotta, gotta, be, you gotta be kidding. Who would want those journals? So uh, Joe is really right. Uh, yeah, expressing it is really important. And what I didn't realize is that those journals serve for me a way of saying, you know, if I thought it, if I felt it, it doesn't matter if I tell anyone, it's worth writing down. That is one of the issues with British culture, the whole keep calm and carry on, the, the, the stiff upper lip, keeping things to yourself. You know, unfortunately, I think it all metastasizes with, within you, which is, which is not good. Um, but I would love to kind of, I guess, switch gears here. Um, and I would love to uh, kind of ask you about um, some of your other work, because I know on the topic of, uh, for instance, bullying, how to not raise a bully, how to deal with bullies. Um, I feel like this is something that I've, I've never talked about on the show. So I'd kind of love to ask you perhaps for some wisdom on if someone's listening to this now, they're dealing with difficult people, you know, unfortunately, kind of part of being alive is having to deal with those difficult people. Um, how can we uh, deal with difficult people in our daily lives or, or bullies, perhaps? I'm, I'm really glad you brought this up because, uh, you know, hiding from bullies, uh, being afraid of them, being afraid to provoke them, lots of people live with that. And you know, and there's no shortage of young people who die by suicide because they're being bullied. And and please, uh, if you're a parent listening in, you know, the parent of uh, one of the people who we did a document, tell my story is is the 
is the title of a suicide note that my other partner, Jason Reed, got that his 14-year-old son wrote, and he turned it into a documentary. And when we give talks, we call, we call it uh, Own the Mental Health of Your Teenager. Because when they go online and they're looking for attention and they put something out there, they have no idea the haters that can drive them to it. So I'd like to, first of all, put aside physical bullying. If it's physical bullying, if skin touches skin, you got to report it somewhere. You know, so this is not about physical bull. You know, unless you want to go take, uh, learn how to learn karate. Uh, I've become friends of the Cove family, you know, on Cobra Kai. Oh, well. Uh, I was on their podcast. And uh, so, because one of the issues that that show deals with is bullying. Someone's always getting bullied on Cobra Kai. Uh, so yes, you know, learn how to defend yourself uh, uh, or find someone to protect you physically. But if you're dealing with someone who's verbally bullying you, there's a good chance they're bullying you because something inside them is bullying them. Mm. Uh, you know, there's a book that I recommend highly to everyone because it's such a game-changing book. It's, it's by Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Bruce Perry. And the title of the book is called What Happened to You? And their belief is that we're basically born innocent. You know, that we're really not born e evil. Now, there may be some scientists and say, well, there may be some, you know, sociopaths. You know, Hitler might have been born evil. But, uh, but basically what they believe is that stuff happened to us. Uh, we were bullied. We were abused. We were molested. And we don't know what to do with it. And it builds up and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up. And either we're going to kill ourselves when it feels like it's going to explode, or we go take it out on someone else. Um, so here is a tip if you're dealing with bullies. One of the things that bullies do is they, they often push us to react. They'll say something, they'll do something, they'll say, oh, look at so-and-so. And, uh, and when they push us to react, we're often really on the defensive. We're scared, we're cornered, you know, and, and our mind shuts down. There's actually something called an, emo a, a, an amygdala hijack, meaning we get too emotional, you know, because, and we go into fight, flight, freeze kind of thing. So here's a crazy idea. Uh, and again, you know, run it by your friends, whether they think it's too crazy. Um, if there's someone who has bullied you verbally, again, if it's physical, we don't, you know, you got to take another action. Uh, uh, and this will, this will sound crazy. But if you have a way to reach that person, text message or email or something, and let's call that person uh, Nick. Let's say Nick was the bully. You send them a text message or uh, an email or something. You say, uh, hey, Nick, it's Mark. I need your help with something. Can we talk tomorrow? What? And you might think, why would you do that? Because you're being proactive. See, instead of being reactive, you're taking the initiative. Uh, and they're, and, and they're likely going to say, what, or what the F, or whatever, blah, 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 blah. And no matter what they say, they say, yeah, Nick, I need your help with something. When can we talk tomorrow? Uh, now, they may avoid you because down deep, they don't know what's going on. And at some level, they think, you know, you know or you're going to retaliate or whatever. And they may avoid you. And if they avoid you, well, you know. One over the bully. But if they give you a time, you say, great, I'll meet you there. Now, when you meet Nick, he's not going to start bullying you because he's just curious. What the heck was that about? You say, and then you say, and then you say to Nick, Nick, 
remember when you said such and such in front of me and everybody, and you got everyone to laugh? Uh, uh, and he's going to go, yeah. He'd say, uh, it really freaked me out because it, it, because it reminded me of something in the third grade that was really, really awful. And uh, what I need your help uh, about is, uh, uh, I think, just like something in the third grade freaked me out, and you freaked me out. Uh, Nick, what happened to you? What happened to you that this is what you said to me that you say to a lot of people? And he's going to go, what? Yeah, yeah, you know, Nick, Nick, you weren't born this way. What happened to you that, you know, this is what you do to me and you do to other people? I'm just curious. And I need, I need your help because I think down deep, Nick, you know, you're just like all of us. You know, we're just trying to make it through life. I told you it was crazy, but can you understand the psychologically why it might work? Because you're being proactive. You're not being, re you're not, you know, he's not provoking you. You're taking charge of it. Uh, you're making him feel important by saying, I need your help with something. Uh, uh, you're, uh, you're connecting to him. Uh, the reason I got so freaked out when you said that to me is it reminded me, you know, so and so in the third grade. Boy, you know, I, I, you know, I, 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 I didn't go back to school for a week, and then you twist it to what happened to you because something happened to Nick that caused that. Now, there's all kinds of strategies. One of my book is called one of my books is called Talking to Crazy how to deal with the irrational and impossible people in your life. So that book is filled with all kinds of things that you can do with people who drive you crazy. And this can be bullies. This can be the people who, who make excuses. This can be anybody who drives you crazy. But I just wanted to give you one little tip that I'm sure, I am guessing none of you ever would have thought of. I think that that's such a great example because if I'm Nick the bully and I'm in this position, the first thing it does is uh, I think in the, the back of my mind, I'm feeling a little bit awkward. I'm feeling like, whoa, this guy's got me off balance. You know, maybe he's not the submissive person that he is. I'm thinking to myself, well, if I do make those comments again, then I'm going to have to have this conversation again. There's going to have to be an effort um, that's involved. And also within that message, the what happened to you message, that, that kind of, it enables a bit of self-reflection on Nick's part. I think that's such a fantastic example. I really love that one. Yeah, and what you're bringing up, Joe, is if I'm Nick, I probably wouldn't bully this person again because it, it, it's just so complicated and the person might call me back the day afterwards and by the way, if you're Nick and you do bully the other person again, what I would do after having the conversation with Nick is I'd let Nick say the comment and then I'd whisper to Nick, Nick, come on, come on, come on, come on. I'd say, Nick, let's go, let, let's go have a talk. And he'd go, what? No, no, come on, come on. And then I'd say, Nick, Nick, what happened to you that you did this again? What's going on? And he's going to avoid you. Right, right. It's like, it's like being forced to step into the shrink's office. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, I would, I am not naming any politicians, but you can fill in the blanks. And it's not just American politicians, but, you know, I would love to have a chance to talk with some of these politicians who tend to be bullies. And I would do the same thing. I would go up to them. I, I, I'd say, I need your help with something. And, they, and they'd be curious. And one of the reasons they're curious because bullies tend to be paranoid. And why are they paranoid? Because they know that if someone bullied them, they'd want to get even. So they're kind of curious when you say, and also you're burying your neck. I need your help with something. Yeah, you know, when you did that the other day, you know, geez, what was that all about? You've obviously written a, a, a number of fantastic books. Uh, and I, I recommend uh, uh, some people check out the Russian translation of, of a, one of one of your books, which I will repeat. I'll leave it to them to, to check out. Uh, but you've obviously written some fantastic books. 
Are there any books that have greatly influenced your life that you would like to recommend to our audience? Well, I'll share one, and it's not just because it's recent, and it's not just because it's written by a fellow named Marshall Goldsmith. Marshall Goldsmith is one of the top executive coaches in the world, and I am fortunate to be part of the 100 coaches. So Marshall has created a community of the top coaches in the world, and it's capped off now at about 250, but he has a new book out called The Earned Life, and, and, and here's a taste of it. And I'll tell you how I've used it because, uh, and we can talk offline how you can use it. One of the chapters he talks about is try to be a one trick genius, not a one trick pony, which is kind of a criticism and a put down. He said, a one trick genius is something where you're the best at it in the world, as opposed to just like everyone else. And he gave the example of being someone with a PhD in, inter, in behavioral psychology. He understands interpersonal behavior. So the way he became a one-trick genius is he figured, you know, big companies will pay a million dollars or a million pounds to recruit a CEO. And they want those CEOs to be successful. And a lot of times those CEOs are unsuccessful, not because of their their technical knowledge, but because they're terrible in dealing with people. Mm. So he created this thing where he could go to the Fortune 500 and say, hey, you spent a lot of money bringing that CEO in. Uh, I've read that he or she, you know, can be pretty rough on people. And, you know, you might want, you might not want to have that happen. You're going to get some lawsuits. So let me come in and I'll find the people he works with and say, hey, I'm working with a CEO. What's, what's some specific behaviors that he or she needs to stop? And I'll just work with the uh, stakeholders because I don't believe what the CEO says about himself or herself. And if the CEO, you know, is willing to do this, I'll just focus on that. Just a single behavior. Yeah, he always interrupts people. She always interrupts people. You know, and your stakeholders said, we'll let go of the grudges if he changes. Because often if one person changes one behavior like that, they're going to improve elsewhere. And I thought, this is genius. So I applied it to myself on LinkedIn. And Marshall encourages us to be a little bit bold. So my LinkedIn profile is world's leading healthy conflict coach. And it works perfectly because everything I've done lines up with it get out of your own way. Yeah. Uh, just listen. Yeah. Talking to crazy. So everything I've done, a uh, psychiatrist, hostage negotiation trainer. So everything lines up with what well, he probably knows a little bit about conflict. Do you follow me? Whereas before, if I listed myself as kind of an executive coach, people would say, he doesn't know anything about business. You know, why should we hire him? Right. But every, do you follow me? Everything. Yeah. And what I do is I, I don't resolve conflicts anymore like I used to. You know, I help CEOs or other people deal with conflict better because just like Marshall was identifying, uh, you know, that often their interpersonal behavior gets in the way of their success. What I've discovered is handling conflicts poorly gets in the way of your success. So, you know, I'm narrowing the way I'm defining myself in the business world. So that's my one trick genius, healthy conflict coach. Make sense? It makes perfect sense. I love it. Uh, so my last question for you today, before I ask you to sign off and finish with, with any messages for our guys is the, Last question we ask at the end of all our podcasts, and I feel like it's very relevant to today's uh, discussion, but the question we always sign off with is what makes a life worth living? At the end of every day, you say to yourself, I gave more to the world today than I took from it. I gave more to the world today than I took from it. I'll share something with you. Uh, uh, 
there was a multi-billionaire, probably one of the richest people in Los Angeles, a fellow named Eli Brode. He died a year ago. And uh, this is how you win friends and influence rich people. I reached out to him, it's got to be eight, nine years ago. And I said, and I had had a conversation with him. So he took the call and he was in a rush. He's always in a, he was always in a rush. I said, Eli, uh, I don't know if you remember me, Mark Olson. Yeah, yeah, I remember you. I'm in a rush, Mark. I said, are you ever going to write a book on philanthropy? He said, I don't know, Mark, I'm in a rush. And I said, Eli, seven seconds. Uh, wealth is what you take from the world. Worth is what you give back. So in a rush, Eli Brode, who's too busy for me, he says, what? I, mm. He said, say that again. I said it to him. He said, that's pretty good, Mark. I said, look, use it. If you're going to write a book, it's a good title. You know, uh, I, I make donations. I'm not rich enough to found foundations, but keep it. Six months later, um, uh, I think Forbes or Fortune calls me and say, hey, we got this article written by Eli Brode. It says Eli Brode picks the seven uh, the seven most powerful billionaires, philanthropists. And he leads with this quote that he attributes to you. <laughs> We're just checking to see if it's true. So if you look up Eli Broad, B-R-O-A-D, Goulston, it's the top thing. In fact, if you look at the search, it will tell you the article and there's the quote. So I just had to do that because of what I said that makes for a good life. You know, and uh, and when you wake up in the morning, make a commitment that today uh, I'm going to give something to the world. And I'll end on this. Before the pandemic, I started a movement called What Made You Smile Today? I have a TEDx talk. What made you smile today? And we started a movement. I have these wristbands and the wristbands go, say, Hashtag WMYST, what made you smile today? And we started a movement where when someone uh, waits on you, a TSA agent, a cashier, and they have a name tag, they're really, you, most of the world treats them like an appliance. They have a name, but they don't have a face. So next time someone does something for you, pause, look at their name, and say to them, uh, hi, Nancy, uh, my name is Mark. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, and she's going to say, what? You could say, Nancy, I have a question for you. No, you're not in any trouble. What made you smile? What made you smile today? And she's going to look up at the ceiling, look down and smile at you because you helped to remember something. And she'll say, my dog, it's a beautiful day. Yeah. Uh, the heat finally left London. <laughs> and, and if you look in her eyes, you'll see a smile. And, and our movement is we have, these, we have these wristbands, hashtag WMYST. And the idea is when we go around and we ask that question, we say to the person, you know, you got a great smile. Here's two wristbands. One, keep to remind you to smile every day because it's so great. And then do this with someone else. Pay it forward. So I'll end with you, Joe. What made you smile today? Garen, to speak to you and uh, all the great value that, that you've brought. Um, the thought that perhaps this conversation could really, really help people that are either you know lost, trying to help a loved one going through something, or that maybe you know they listen to the great advice that you gave on being bullied. So I feel like, you know, I, I can rest a, a happy man. Um, so I, I feel I feel really good about that. Thank you. So I don't have to wake up Larry King and tell him I blew another uh, a new, another interview? You tell Larry <laughs> King that you will welcome back anytime. I will. And he'll say, and he'll say great, great, Mark. You know, <laughs> how can I go back and rest in peace? <laughs>
Amazing. Mom, where can these guys connect with you? And where, what would you like to direct our audience to? So I would like you, please, let's save some lives. Stay alive. An intimate conversation about suicide prevention. It's on Amazon Prime. Uh, check my podcast, my wake up call. Uh, it's available wherever you find your podcasts. Uh, I have a website, markgoulston.com. And uh, uh, I have my LinkedIn profile is pretty up to date. And if you know people who want to become better, because I, I don't do remedial work anymore. I mean, uh, I only work with people who say, hey, I deal with conflict every day and I'm terrible at it. Mm. So you can find me on LinkedIn. I was extremely looking forward to this conversation and, um, you know, going through your work in preparation for this, watching the great documentaries that we talked about, going through your podcast, through your, your blog. Uh, it was a fantastic learning experience for me. And uh, you're a tremendous storyteller. And um, I, I really, really appreciate the, the mission and the great work that um, clearly is so meaningful to you. Uh, so thank you for bringing so much value to our audience today. Thank you for your audience because you bring value to them. And, uh, uh, and it's very important for you to enrich their lives because one of the things you don't want to do is waste your viewers or listeners time because you want to honor that. And I hope today, together, you and I were able to give them something that didn't waste their time.